One of the most controversial Americans of our time, O.J. Simpson, dead at 76 after a battle with prostate cancer. He's regarded as one of the greatest running backs of all time and used his sports fame to turn himself into a household name. He starred in Hertz commercials and many movies. But everything changed the night of June 12, 1994, when Simpson's ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ronald Goldman, were found brutally stabbed to death in the courtyard outside her home in L.A. O.J. charged with their deaths. He was tried and eventually acquitted in the trial of the century. At this point, is it is a pursuit, and unfortunately, it has a lot of uh, mitigating circumstances because of the, uh, the high profile of the uh, 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 proposed suspect that's inside the vehicle, which could possibly be and uh, appears to be at this time O.J. Simpson. It was the most dramatic and heart-stopping moment of this trial. In front of the jury, O.J. Simpson tried on the gloves prosecutors say he was wearing the night he murdered his ex-wife. He tried to show the gloves do not fit. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson. O.J. was sued separately by the Goldmans and the Browns in civil court for wrongful death, where a jury found him liable. The Goldman family speaking out about his death, saying, The only thing I have to say is, it's just for the reminder of Ron being gone all these years. It's no great loss to the world. It's a further reminder of Ron's being gone. Judge Janine, I mean, this, it was interesting to listen to some of the younger producers today who didn't, you know, live through it and know about it. They might have watched the documentary about it or the re uh, that show that was on it. But for those of us who live through it, and I'm sure from your lens as a lawyer and a judge, it was well, I was one of the talking heads. <laughs> uh, so, so that's why we have you here yes, today. Yes, I I was a sitting DA at the time, and I'll never forget June 12th. I had just been elected the DA in Westchester County in New York, and uh, one of the guys. I have my whole office at my house for a barbecue. One of the guys came out. He said, "Boss." O.J. Simpson is in a white Bronco, and the police are chasing him. So a few, a few of us went in to the kitchen, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, and then we realized, we went into the den, because there were a lot more of us, that there, he was supposed to show up at the police department and turn himself in. He refused to do so. So, you know, we're all these prosecutors together and saying, you know, this consciousness of guilt, this is flight. But what we didn't realize that night was that this was the beginning of one of the most sensational trials, uh, if not the most sensational trial of the, se of the century. The media was fascinated. The public was fascinated. The public had never seen a courtroom. They had never seen a trial. People would run home from work and say, I've got to watch the trial. I've got to see what was going on. And I and so many others, I mean, I stayed as DA, and I was a judge before that, but I, I, I didn't go into television from there, but so many people got their, got their jump into television from this. But one of the most significant parts of this is the United States and people in this country were all involved in this shared experience of what the criminal justice system is like and the new DNA. What did it mean? How significant was it? What about, you know, uh, the, the PCR? What about all of the other different types? And then there was the undercurrent of racism in this trial that, because of Mark Furman, uh, was brought to a head. And there were so many people who were very critical of the, of the uh, decision by the jury here in this trial that ran for nine months. Mm -hmm. It ran mm -hmm. for nine months. I mean, this was a—I mean, people made careers out of this. And the jury made the decision in less than four hours. And I remember being on live television at the time, and they came in and focused on all of us. And, you know, this was a jury of eight blacks and two mixed race and, I believe, two whites. And there were many who believed that because of the racism, because of the issues that Mark Furman was involved in, that, that, that the Goldmans and that Nicole Brown Simpson were literally paying for the sins of the fathers. And there has always been this question about, is he guilty or isn't he? And, you know, for those of us who understood the forensics and the and the DNA and all of the other stuff going on, 
You know, the idea that the glove didn't fit, give me a break. The glove was covered with blood. The blood shrunk. Of course he couldn't get his hands in the gloves. But, you know, you accept the decision of the jury, and, of course, he got burnt later in the civil case where he barely paid any of the money. But the public fascination with this, it began a whole new line of people with crime stories and, and, and court TV. And all of us who love this and made this part of our careers, uh, we were happy that from now on we had juries who understood what DNA was. They understood direct circumstantial evidence. Anyway. I could ask you uh, 20,000 more yeah, questions, but uh, Richard Fowler, um, from your perspective. Uh, listen, I want to pick up where the judge left off, because I remember uh, this case. Well, I was in the third grade when this verdict <laughs> came out, and I remember sitting in, th in class when the teacher played it on a red radio, uh, and I remember the reaction that I had because, to the judge's point, this case was rife with race because there was so much. I mean, to understand the prism of the O.J. Simpson trial, you have to understand what was happening in L.A. That's at right. that time. Right. Two years prior to this, there was the Rodney King beating that was caught on tape in 1991. Those four officers got a change of venue to Simi Valley and they were acquitted after beating Rodney King. And so there was a just tension in the air. And if you go back and, and we were talking to producers in the green room before the show, and like you could literally watch the footage and see two Americans People who were neighbors and one folk, black people saying this is great and white people crying at the same time watching this verdict, despite the evidence, just because of where we were as a country and just how rife the racial tension was around the LAPD. In few, and I think that was sort of made worse by the Mark Furman tapes that had come out in the middle of the trial. And this is just an interesting moment in history. But to, to, to the judge's point, too, it also created the cable news cycle, the 24-hour media, all this idea that you can follow a case and these true crime stories, that this narrative that we now live in was created by this case, by the O.J. Simpson true. trial. And here we are, uh, a lot of years later. Here we are, prime time. Just a little bit older than Richard. I was 16 <laughs> when this happened. I used to come back from practice and watch the case. And I do remember exactly what you said and realizing how divided the country was. I think as a white guy, I was like, wow, this guy's a killer. He just got away with murder. The evidence is obvious. And then you see images of black America celebrating. And I'm not saying all black America felt that O.J. was innocent. Uh, I'm saying that when you see people cheering and then explaining that, good, you know, finally we have someone who looks like us use the justice system in their favor. And it was almost like a wake-up call. People realized, wait a second, you know, maybe this system isn't always about justice. Maybe it's about money. And O.J. Simpson was so wealthy, and to the judge's point, I finally started admiring these defense lawyers. These guys, they called the dream team. You pay these guys so much money, and it was almost like they had superpowers. I was dazzled with Johnny Cochran. I was just hanging on every word he said. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, not only did the glove shrink because of the blood, Judge, he had advised O.J. to stop taking his arthritis medication. Mm. So his knuckles had swollen. And so, mm. and then you're looking at the DNA evidence and you're looking, wait a second, this stuff can get contaminated. And, and thankfully, years later, the chain of custody has now gotten perfect where you don't even let anybody breathe near this thing. Um, I just want to just say my, my heart goes out to the Goldman family, uh, the Brown family. It does look like the estate now owes them almost $100 million sure. because O.J., how I don't know how he did it. He avoided somehow not paying these people almost a dime. I hope they collect. Are you going to say how old you were, Greg? I wasn't born. So it's nice to hear this from all these old people. Now, I got to say, this one really hurts. Um, it's funny. I always think of that car rental commercial when I'm running through the airport after stabbing two people. Uh, did you know that Steve Ducey's wife was in that commercial? She's the one who tosses the car keys to O.J. I think she really dodged a bullet or at least a knife. I think O.J.'s real crime was making Jeffrey Tubin famous. <laughs> Uh, a little stuff, some facts about O.J. He left behind five children and other people he didn't murder. Um, he dies holding the, uh, the, I guess, the record for the average rushing yards per game and most stabs in a Brentwood driveway. Do we really know he's dead, though? Maybe we should ask an L.A. jury. They might declare him alive. Who's going to search for the real killer now? I hear Jesse Smollett is free. He's been searching <laughs> for those other Trumpers. Maybe he could pack 
this in. And then one note to Khloe Kardashian. You may have lost a dad, but you still have two moms. So now, <laughs> justice, my, my lesson here is justice is wholly fallible if it can be throttled from outside forces. You can't get a fair trial, and that wasn't a fair trial to the victims. So you need to apply that lesson to now. We are in a political and a social and emotional climate where getting a fair trial is hard to get. And as much as you hate Derek Chauvin, right? You still know that trial wasn't fair, thanks to the documentary, The, the Fall of Minneapolis. And Michael Avenatti agrees that there's no chance for a fair trial for Trump in New York, or else the proponents wouldn't mind if you moved it outside of New York. So what I learned, it's not about the evidence in the trial, it's where you present it. It's not about what's inside the courtroom, it's about what's outside the courtroom and how it applies pressure to the judge and the jury, whether it's the threat of public chaos or media outrage. The OJ trial showed us what would and what could come when the court of public opinion trumps the actual court of law. That jury made a political decision, an emotional decision, but it certainly wasn't a legal one. Wasn't justice. If I could make a programming note tonight, we have Cato Kalin on Jesse Waters. Ooh. It's a great booking. All you right. A thump on the wall. O.J. Simpson, <laughs> uh, dead at 76 years old today. Ahead, President Biden hobnobbing with celebrities at a state dinner while Americans skip meals to afford housing. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You won't get it anywhere else.